Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are vocalist Susan Dehim and composer Richard Horowitz. Vocalist, composer, performance artist Suzanne Dehim was born and raised in Tehran, where she began her career dancing with Iran Pars National Ballet Company, then with the Maurice Béjart Ballet Company. She's been at the forefront of experimental music for many, many years, more than 20 years. Suzanne performed her one-woman show at the Whitney Museum, La Mama, Brooklyn uh, Academy of Music, as well as venues all over the world. And she's recorded widely as a solo artist She's collaborated with visual artists like Shireen Nishat and Lita Albuquerque, our friend, and worked in theater as a director and choreographer. How did ballet become your first career? Well, it, it goes back to my life in Iran. I, I went to a um, high school um, that was a pretty progressive high school. It was like a Sarah Lawrence um, type school. Private uh, girls school, was it? It wasn't private. It was, uh, it was actually uh, semi-private. Uh, and it was um, a very difficult school to get in. Uh, the ladies were pretty tough-headed, <laughs> but they had to study. It wasn't just like an uh, attitude didn't do. <laughs> so in that school, there was a, uh, they started a ballet class, and I didn't know what, you know, I just was passing by, and I saw this class, and I found it pretty ridiculous. And I just said, well, that's kind of weird. What are they doing? And then I realized it was a ballet class, and they were doing all this sort of stretching and everything. And uh, just, I think I just wanted to uh, take a take a piss. I just went to the class. <laughs> I said, I'm going to go, you know, and put the leotard and everything. And I went there. And after a couple of classes, I was very hooked. Is that right? I was very hooked. And that was it. That and was you must it. have been good if you danced with the well, company. Well, yeah. I mean, I, you know, you had to have the physique, you know, yeah, the ballet. So you must it have doesn't been matter. Perfect. You know, yeah, it, it, it started being a serious uh, situation. Take me away from my med career. Your medical <laughs> career? Uh, did every girl in Iran want to be a doctor? No, but my father was a, you know, among others, he was a scientist, and he really wanted me to be in sciences, and I was very interested in that too. So not necessarily medical science, but but in general sciences, and it didn't happen. Well, did dancing, Béjart is a very good company. Yes. So you had Fantastic. to have been at the top of your field. Did, did that company bring you to the U.S.? That company brought me to the U.S. a couple of times and South America and the rest of Europe, yeah. Were you exiled from Iran? No, but I certainly wasn't welcomed back. <laughs> why, why would you? <laughs> have you been back? No. No. I haven't been back. So when you went to, to dance with Béjart, um, was that the time when you left Iran and then never went back? Yes, I oh, went to went. school, I auditioned, uh, and I got accepted at the school, and uh, then I just, you know, that was it. And when I finished school, I danced with the company, and after a year and some, um, I wasn't really happy with that kind of ballet life. Where was that? Where did you In go Brussels. to school? In Brussels. Brussels. So did you go to school in Brussels then? I went to school I in Brussels, see, I yeah. see. And then um, I left uh, the company and I went to New York and uh, just before, in the process of going to New York, the hostages were taken in Iran. Oh. So my going back to New York was a uh, pretty tricky uh, decision, but I did go back and go to New York and uh, crazy enough, they let me in. Well, we were lucky because you're Thank such you. a talent. Thank you very and, much. And <laughs> um, it sounds like you're a little bit of a rebel, like you're a little bit on the outside of the box. And what? And, and you've been in experimental music for more than 20 years. Right. What do we call experimental music? 
and when does it become mainstream? Well, um, <laughs> when um, it's experimental because it doesn't follow. Um, there's music that there's. I mean, in general, I think there are things you learn in schools. And oh, it doesn't follow that line. Well, basically, I'm more in, more interested in creating schools than going to schools. Oh, I see. So, and that's I think experimental music or experimental arts, experimental. Um, uh, you know, yeah, arts basically is to create new linguistics for the medium you're in. Well, you create those linguistics, but pretty soon they become familiar to your ears. So that's yeah. when, like, like Philip Glass, when mm -hmm. you first started hearing what he was doing, and now you know it's on the opera stage, right. and it's an ear that you that you become accustomed to. Yes. And so your experimental music. I guess, has to go into the mainstream. Then what happens to you? Do you keep ahead or do you stay with that? What do you well, do? Well, it's not because you do experimental music that it, it, it needs to be, um, you know, not reaching out to people. I mean, I think you could do very, I mean, you know, you had Miles, you know, that, you know, <laughs> that was, you have, yeah. uh, you know, Mingus. You in know? the jazz, yeah, they, I see. You know, they did things that, they, you know, you know, Ornette Coleman, they did things in their own time. People thought they were crazy out of their minds. But between you know someone who's really talented and and, and you know and forward looking and audiences, if there's the third party is not stiff, I, I, I think actually the relationship will you know the, the the transcending the information will happen much faster. It crosses over. Yeah. One one thing every time I read anything about your music, the word mystical kept coming up. Mystical, mystical. Right. How do you explain that? And what are they talking about when they say mystical? Well, I think it's just the vibration that's very interesting to me, you know, being, um, you know, from Iran and, and uh, having heard a lot of, uh, being really in love with a lot of ancient music, whether it's from Middle East or from Africa, from all over the place. Um, there's a vibration in, uh, in uh, you know, ancient music, sacred music that, uh, even if you're not, I, I, I don't really like uh, this whole music and logical side of things, although it's, it's important to have teachers uh, talking, decide, you know, deconstructing uh, where the music comes from. And, but I, I'm more interested in alchemical vibration of those music, and it's been and always an inspiration for me. And whether I'm doing jazz or I'm doing uh, music from Iran, uh, that vibration is always part of my music. And that is what sounds mystical to other people, or has so. the mystic quality of the work, I guess. Well, I think I think it's a vibration that once you you know receive and once you get um, uh, involved with in music. Vibration sounds good. It always vibration sounds like it explains it a yeah, little bit. Yeah, because it's not uh, you know it's not uh, a. a, a um, Sonic experience or like right. a smart thing. It's it's really it's really a vibration, and that that word is used too often. And for someone um, a New Yorker, uh, it's a little tricky to use that word too many times. But it's hard to say anything else. It's, it is a vibration. But but you feel the vibration. You worked with with uh, Shireen Nishat, who's like yeah. a fantastic artist, and you did Logic of the Birds, a video, mm -hmm. and it, where was it? It was shown at Lincoln Center in the kitchen and uh, the Walker Museum. Walker Art Center. What was it? What was it like? And what was it about? Uh, well, that uh, specific project actually was based on. Uh, a book by Attar called oh. The Conference of the Birds, uh, which is um, a magnificent uh, book of mystical poetry, and in which the, uh, there's a, the mythical bird um, takes a flock of, it's all very mythical, I mean, uh, uh, metaphorical. Uh, she takes um, a group of birds into these seven valleys of wisdom, its journey to reach God, to reach love, and it happens that in the esoterics of the 13th century, it happens that it's a she-bird. It's a she-bird, great. So we just <laughs> thought, like, mm, that's where we're going to tell the mullahs to go home and never come back. We will be the she-people. We will the be the she-people. She people. Um, with that, did you use those words for your vocals? The words from the text, or did you create well, your own vocals? It was very complicated to do that, um, just because uh, the project became so complex in terms of sound design. 
Oh. And because it's a bird, she's a bird, we decided to, we used a little bit of the uh, poetry, but we really decided to stay away from the language and really go more for, tran for uh, um, basically adaptation of, again, the feeling and the vibration of the valleys, <laughs> the seven valleys of wisdom. Uh, so it was a pretty com you know, complex uh, sound design, it's a surround sound was in collaboration with Richard Horowitz, who you're going to talk to, right? my partner. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, and to tell you the truth, one of the pieces on, from that project has now become one of my most sort of wanted pieces. Uh, oh, it's it called was. Uh, uh, Windfall. And I sang uh, a very beautiful poem by Rumi called Bishnoazne, oh. which basically, I, and I did a recording of that, which I released recently, and uh, every single benefit once that specific piece and very recently U2 is using that piece on their tour which is which is wonderful because it's a very very deep piece and uh, and so Rumi I, is mystical and Rumi and so is, here we are back yeah, to that again Rumi is turbulent which you also did with her when uh, the golden lion at the right. Venice Biennale right and um, that um, has been shown everywhere. Yeah. I know our friend Nicolette Ramirez is at the Chelsea Art Museum. You've done work there. Right, right. But the, the thing that I found, how I found you, were the vocals for the film, The Stoning of Soroya, Soroya M, M. Mm -hmm. which was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it came uh, to me three days before they had to send it to... Um, three days before? Three days, or <laughs> I mean, literally, it was like a week before they were sending it to Toronto Film Festival for the first screening. So that was Cyrus Narashti, the director? Yes, but my invitation actually came from uh, John Debney, the composer. Oh, the composer, yes. I see. He's a very interesting composer, does a lot of very, very big Hollywood films, and... Uh, and he invited me to, to work with him and also mentioned that it's a pretty political con you know, uh -huh. context in, you yes, know, in which really. you're going to be. Do you want to be associated? I said, well, you know, if I didn't spend a lot of time with activists uh, like Eve Ensler, who's a dear friend, and oh, if Eve. I didn't know about all the atrocities that we do to women um, uh, you know, on the globe, then I would feel like, oh, my, maybe this is just a story about, you know, propaganda story about mullahs or whatever, but it isn't. Stoning happens in this time, still on our globe, and That was what happens. was so amazing. It happens. Uh, it's not actually something that happens in Iran. Iran doesn't have the reputation. It's not part of our culture. It isn't part, it of, isn't your part culture. of our culture. No, I mean, it happens a lot more in, like, you know, you know, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, in certain areas, no, in mostly in Afghanistan. But it, it does happen everywhere. I mean, it happens in Africa. It happens in China, apparently. So it's, it's not something that you go like, oh, my God, you know, this has happened, you know, in the, in the Middle Ages. It doesn't happen. It happens now on our globe. That's what's so hard to, yeah. to take. And that film was so beautifully done, I thought. Yes. And the music was so beautiful. And it drives you to see the sensibility of what's going on. Yeah. Well, the one thing that I, after finding you and after reading your bio, you were at the UN Spiritual Leaders Assembly in 2001. Yes, I And was. I was there, You're too. You're joking. That's amazing. It was, weren't those people incredible, all dressed in different kinds of it's garbs? It's so from interesting. To you. I just performed at the United Nations General Assembly on a very big event for Pakistan like oh, last oh, you week, were just few days there, ago. Right. And the thing that I was telling everyone was the last time I came on this stage, <laughs> I was asked to sing for the spiritual leader, leaders of the world. And I'm like, but sure, you know, of course, you know, sure. Until you saw them So all. I come out on that stage and I see the place filled with relatively old, pretty much old people, all costumed in their... Costumed? In their monk... The Greeks, you know, the, the, the Armenians, priests, the, the, the Indians. The Indians, the, 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 the whole... Uh, you know, the Africans. It was the most... Uh, intimidating experience of like it was it was stunning though wasn't time it stopped when i came out i'm like here okay i'm gonna go and i'm like looking at the audience and i'm like okay now I, why am i here it was fantastic i know so you it were was there i thought it was the most exciting That's thing i'd amazing. done at the un but the other thing you did that was for all the spiritual leaders you were in geneva uh, with just the women spiritual leaders uh, were you there as well no i was oh, not yes. there but was it I the was. same kind of thing well, 
I am very, very sad to tell you that the spiritual leaders of the world, the women, were not as well received. It was sadly, it was a great event and it was beautiful bonding be between everyone and obviously it was a very noble gathering. But there was just, I'm not sure what, what, whether it was the set of circumstances that um, other reasons or it was because we were all women. Oh, it I wonder, felt yeah. like Was Shireen Abadi there at that one? No. Oh, she was. That was a, a little bit before Shireen Abadi got the, the Nobel. Before she got the Nobel yes. uh, Award. But I have sang at a couple of, uh, you know, situations where Shireen was getting a, an award and and uh, I'm so happy she's around. And the, the other um, friend is Lita Albuquerque. Yes. And she's a, she's a dear friend and a fantastic um, artist. Fantastic who, artist. Who is like of the universe. She's the like universe. out there, isn't she? I've never seen anyone who could just go like, okay, let's go to the ocean. It's like November, <laughs> like 31 or whatever. Yeah, what and then she goes in and she swims into the ocean Athletically, she's fantastic. She's fantastic, and I love the art, and we have a great project together, which oh, I hope good. will good. be a great project. Well, I'm so glad you came to visit thank us you. today. Thank you for your invitation. And thank you for being with us. Don't go away. We're going to be with uh, composer Richard Horowitz, and he also has collaborated with Suzanne, and we'll hear what he does in his instrumentals. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with composer, multi-instrumentalist Richard Horowitz, who specializes in Middle Eastern music. He lived in Paris and Morocco for more than 10 years, where he studied music, Oriental philosophy, and learned to speak French and Arabic. He's been featured in several films. He uh, Worked. Did you write the music? Did you do the uh, scores for any given Sunday? Yes. Yes, <laughs> and you won a BMI award, <laughs> and you were given the Naras Award for Life yes. Without Death. And I think uh, the most noted uh, film that you've worked on is The Sheltering Sky, which won a Golden Globe and an LA Film Critics Award. Richard is living in LA now after uh, moving here from London. And Richard, you've lived all over the world. Where were you born and raised? Upstate New York, but I, I grew up in New York. And, and did you and go I, to schools there? I, I left. I left. I went to this very unusual school where all the teachers were from someplace else, and oh. and uh, it was kind of it was a Dewey System school called the Park School. Ah. And uh, so it was kind of like project-based learning kind of thing. And uh, I was in love with my French teacher's daughter when I was ten, and oh. spent a lot of time at their house. And they were a couple <laughs> from Algeria. Oh, did, so did you start learning French then? Yeah. Oh, you did. So, and then they, and they, the, the, the chemistry teacher was from India, and she used to play us Ravi Shankar. And Is that really, right? It was very interesting. That was but, a cool school. Yeah. So uh, by the time I was seventeen, I was reading more interesting books in the French class than in the English class. Did you um, yeah. go to music schools? No. You never did. So this was like your basis from early age. Yeah, I just studied a privately. little kid. I studied privately, and uh, I didn't want to go to a music school. Well, where did you, obviously, when I ask, where did your interest in Middle Eastern music come from? It came from early on. Yeah, it came from the, uh, <laughs> from the my, my girlfriend's, <laughs> your girlfriend's father. Yeah, they were always father. playing Middle Eastern music at their house. They were, pied, it's see. called Pied Noir, was the, the oh, Blackfeet yeah. Algerians, the French that were in Algeria. Did they have a different the, kind of music, the Pied Noir? Well, I mean, they, they were called Pied Noir, they were French, the French, but the music yeah. that they were playing was really, the, was really, uh, Algerian music uh, from the Algerian Andalusian music, the new uh, Algerian Nuba, they were into that. And, uh, well, I, I knew they were, um, they came from that yeah, era, Algeria, right. but I thought when they got to France, did, did that um, influence oh. their music at all? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm talking about the French couple, the Chanteaux, that I, who were uh -huh. their teachers when I was 10. Uh -huh. But if you're talking about the influence of uh, North African music in France. Yeah. That's, that, that, yeah. That I mean, there was a, I mean, that, that Rye was a big influence in French music, and and even uh, rap was a big influence in in, um, 
in, 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 in Paris. I, I recorded the first uh, Arab rap song for a French film called The Chicken Thief in 1992 with Hassan Hakmoun rapping in Arabic. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> but you have to have a certain yeah. mentality to actually um, feel that music, I think. I don't, I don't think that's an American sensibility. I, I have an Armenian background, uh -huh. so I've heard that kind of music. Right. Um, but a New Yorker wouldn't necessarily have heard that music, except for your peculiar circumstance. Well, if you grew up in some sort of orthodox temple, oh, you that's might, true you might too. have heard it. They didn't have a cantor at my temple, which I was, I was very disappointed about. Actually, oh. the, they had a, a keyboard player who was also, also my mother's accompanist. She was a singer. She had a coast-to-coast -coast radio oh. show. But he, he played keyboard at the temple and then went to play at the church on the street as the same guy, you know, pl played organ at both places. He played the organ and he yeah, played, yeah, did he? Yeah, yeah. So, so it was totally different. But he was, yeah, well, he was interesting. He was, he was an interesting uh, character, Irving Shire, who was, he was actually David Shire's father. Oh, yeah, the yeah. music, yeah. the composer. Yeah. Yeah. The thing, yeah. talking about that, I didn't put all of that together where you could get that from your temple, you could get that sound. Yeah, I could have, but I didn't. But you didn't, didn't but, but didn't get it's, very much else from that temple either. It's but. there, <laughs> but when you, <laughs> um, the way you look, you, yeah. you lived in Morocco, you're renowned in your instrumentals and your music, your Arabic music. Do they accept you from the way you, you don't look like them? Well, yeah, I mean, they accept you for being some, a uh, person who's not them, but interested in finding out about them, and they they love that. That's why. That's yeah. who, because yeah, you they, play with because, a lot of groups. Well, because you want to. They if if you take the time to really learn about their culture, then they get more interested in you. you and then to, you're good at it too. I know a few things. I, uh, I'm I'm really not an ethnomusicologist. I just I'm an artist that picked up enough to to influence my work. I don't. My repertoire is, used to be better. It's not. I don't, I don't really play the repertoire anymore. Oh, you used to yeah, do that. But I, I, you, this whole thing about the modes that are so interesting, and uh, uh, it's interesting because it's made with quarter tones. That's what interested me. It means that this, the note that's in between, you know, E and E flat, in, 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 is so, the tone. Is the is the quarter tone that they use that, that doesn't exist in the West? Oh, I see. That's yeah. why you get that kind of mystical yeah, yeah, sound. Yeah. Well, I can. Uh, I, I was overhearing the interview with Susan and. I, uh, my best story about mysticism is as I was at the bank in London uh, and I, I asked for my uh, balance and the teller said to me, this lovely woman, she said, where would you like your balance after or before your last withdrawal because we always like to give you the worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, listen dear, it really doesn't matter to me if one is pessimistic or uh, optimistic. <laughs> the most important thing is to remain a mystic. Is to re be mystic. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And talking about that kind of music, you really um, were best known by the Ber uh, Bernardo Bertolucci sheltering sky. Tell us that whole scenario, how you got involved. I think the book was written by Paul Bowles. Right. Well, I first met Brian Geisen, uh, who was uh, 10 years younger than Paul, who was uh, the lesser known of the uh, Burroughs, Bowles, Geisen, Triumvirate, and oh, Tangier. That, oh, that was you know, He was the one who introduced Brian Jones to the Rolling, to the uh, Jujuka, and he was a, also known for, he exposed to the Surrealist when he was 18 and was kicked out by Breton, but was good friends with Tristan Tazara and took his cut-up method and gave it to Burroughs, which became Burroughs' cut-up method. And where did and this guy, Geiser, come from? Geisen, Geisen was Canadian. Oh, he, he was Canadian, he, he, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, so I met him, he was living in Paris at the Cité des Arts at that point. And uh, I'd already been going back and forth to Morocco for a long time. He said, well, the next time you go, here's a letter of introduction to Paul. Oh. And I really didn't know that much about Paul. I'd read The Sheltering Sky and I'd read A Hundred Camels in the Courtyard. And if you think what it was before, I, none of the books had come out about Paul or anything yet. It was the middle of the 70s. So I knocked on Paul's door and, and this- uh, We're got, in Tangier. Yeah, in Tangier, in this, in this small apartment in the Amublin Tessa. And, and, um, and uh, Mohammed Rabin answered the door, and uh, another uh, uh, great Moroccan personality, uh, s sort of a street character that Paul, tra Paul translated and made famous. And 
And I said, well, I'm a friend of Brian Geisen's. And he looked at me and slammed the door in my face. That was it? Because <laughs> <laughs> he hated Brian. They didn't get along very well. I think there, he was, you know, there was some sort of jealousy going on. Uh, so uh, then Paul said, no, no, let him in, let him in. You know? And then we talked. And right away, I mean, it was right after Jane died. So Paul was, but still. I, Jane was his wife. Yeah, I, I was expecting something, somebody who was going to be more like what I knew about his books. It was something, somebody much darker. And he was actually very uh, wonderfully open and, and funny and, and gracious and, uh, and uh, so really inspiring. So he became inspiring. your mentor in yeah, a way? Yeah, he became like a second father. Is that right? You yeah. became so close yeah. after yeah. that? Yeah. Did you spend a lot of time in Tangier? Yeah, or did I, went he up move to see him. I went up to see him regularly. What musicians came to visit him? Well, I mean, uh, every, all, a lot of known musicians, you know, you can go through I mean, the Stones and, you know. All they all the, came uh, to? Yeah, you know, all the, you know, uh, you know, the classical musicians from New York. And they, at, at one point, um, Bowles recommended you for the Goddard Lieberson Composition Award. Yeah, that was in 1982. And, um, that which, which was interesting. I had just gotten back to the States. And, was it uh, for a particular piece that you had written? Well, or? there are a few pieces. I wrote something for uh, Daniel Kolbiaka, who was the uh, first violinist of the San Francisco Symphony at that point. Oh. And uh, it was just a duo with Daniel and, and me playing synthesizer. That was getting a lot of airplay. But you, um, but, but was it classical? It was, it was, uh, uh, it was um, tonal, and it was, mm. it was, it was kind of beautiful. Uh, and and he's a classical classical musician. That's why I was asking. I was playing synthesizer. It was kind of a crossover. I see. Uh, I see. Uh, I'll, I'll get you a copy of it. That's a little bit of, um, more than well, well so about the shell right, so, guy. So <laughs> then. Uh, then uh, uh, years went by, and uh, oh, and, it did. Yeah, it because did. I mean, this was like this. I met Paul in 1975, uh, and this is we're talking about 1989. Oh. And, and, uh, and oh, so you did have a long relationship yeah, before you even got there. I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, before I went to work on it, yeah. uh, And and Paul let me know that the film was going to be made, and he sent Bernardo to a concert that Susan and I were doing at the ICA in London. Uh, and Bernardo left, left, left a little note say, on a napkin saying, please call me. And we went to meet him in Notting Hill Gate. And, and then we went off on this tour for another year after that. I guess we, that was, the concert was in 88 or so. You went on a tour with Su Suzanne, Suzanne Dayheim? Yeah, Day yeah to, to uh, Japan and Indonesia. And, and did that. you play an instrument with her? Yeah, or I did played you? keyboards and, and I percussion, I flute, flutes, Moroccan flutes. And, and, uh, and, and anyway, so finally, uh, I, I, Bernardo called up and said, you know, we'd like you to work on it. And, and uh, they flew me to Sabaudi, which is where he shot uh, La Luna. It's his beach house. And it was just me and Bernardo and Mark Peplo kind of talking about Paul and what, what, what I knew about him and just to kind of help them out. And, but basically what happened, since Paul was also in the film, it became like I was kind of like the go-between that whenever they didn't necessarily want to confront front each other about certain things that maybe Paul <laughs> wanted or didn't want in the script or Bernardo wanted to put in the script that weren't in the book and things like that. Because you have so, the relationship with both. So I kind of like ended up being, and then also uh, musically Paul wanted me to go to Algeria to uh, work with Algerian musicians because he wrote it in Algeria and Jeremy the Thomas and the producer and Bernardo uh, didn't think, or especially Jeremy didn't think that that was such a good idea. Uh, so and there were a lot of interesting things that happened. I, I have some great stories. I mean, one of them was, um, well, uh, suffice it to say that by the end of the process, I had to take Paul to the hospital to have his tongue surgically removed from his cheek. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, well, was he like, uh, was he happy with the project? No, uh, uh, well, uh, tongue and cheek. Uh, I got it. Well, uh, uh, or not. Uh, listen, as far as I'm concerned, Bernard, it was so. It was the process of working with Bernardo was an incredible process, and I have ultimate respect for Bernardo. And I think that the reason he makes films and the reason he he wants to do something, uh, and 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 how he goes about it is is somehow so so deep and so personal that uh, that he exposes himself to uh, uh, to a lot of criticism. I see. And I see. Uh, and even and even when he even when he, and and. and it's a class, it was a classic situation of the writer of the book uh, not 
being able to deal with the film of the book because right. that book of all books was the impossible book that nobody dared make because it was 98% in the characters' heads. And for years and, and years and yeah, years, right. they didn't even try right. to do it. Yeah. But I think what you're saying, any artist has right. that problem. It's right. a problem of letting go or a different vision. Sure. And right. before we leave, show us your instrument. Oh, well, this Will is, you? Uh, you asked me to bring something portable, so I brought this. Uh, it's a beautiful yeah. case. Yeah, it's a really nice case. I got it on Portobello Road. I think that was a map case originally. Oh, how clever of and, you. Uh, and then this is, uh, these are these little flutes that you play. Uh, I can are try there several in there? Yeah, there are a bunch of them. They're different sizes. Oh, so you can, oh, I see. And uh, I'll play it for you for a second here. Did you, you uh, circular breathe, on the Brotherhood circular breathe, classically musicians don't. Classical musicians have modes that are more interesting, so I kind of put the two together, the intensity of the trance. Okay, thing let's and, see and if we the, can hear it. It may overload on the mic here. Physically taxing. Well, you have to. It sounds have, like it. You have to breathe. Yeah, you, you it's you, a you different. Go, and then you, you know, so you get that, and then and then the high register sounds like this. Yeah. We're, we're ready to yeah. leave, okay. but one of the things is ethnic fusion. What does it mean? Because you're rooted in jazz, classical, and electronic. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a quick ethnic fusion? It means that whatever... Ex explanation. <laughs> whatever, whatever you have these roots and you draw from your roots at the appropriate moment to find the right thing for the right moment, what you need, as long as you can go there and you, you then you go there and then you turn sometimes they they, they cross over they cross over in your brain and their brains artists are 80 percent more prone to synesthesia than uh, than normal <laughs> humans and so we have kept some of the wiring in our brain more together for just the, you know in order to be making making these crossover points again re do some <laughs> go get, get 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 vs ramachandran on your show he's a great berkeley brain scientist that okay. talks about that <laughs> I can't understand anything you say. Oh, really? Thank you, Richard. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Dave. And, um, thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks thank very you. much. Thank and keep writing. Uh, email jaquin1 at aol.com. J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at aol.com. Yeah. And 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. Bye. See you on, uh, the next time we're here with you. Uh -huh.